You've had it right here with this semester, so right here. It's this class, I know. It's just. Yeah, definitely. You're talking about a kid in the hat. I, I was. You're talking about Justin? I was, t <laughs> I was talking to Mr. Bivens, thank you. <laughs> He's right there. What did you say to me? I don't know anybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> you two have too much time on your hands. That's all I'm going to say. All right, let's get started. We are in lecture 19. Um, uh, we're sort of rocking and rolling on schedule, but I kind of wanted to um, uh, give you a big picture view of my plan between now and spring break because it's uh, we don't have an exam coming up like tomorrow or anything. But I did want to like plant the seed um, uh, as to what the plan is moving forward. So has everybody gotten the code? Okay. All right. So um, here's the schedule. Um, let me see if I can, I don't know, make this full screen. Ah, never mind. This is good enough. Okay. So we are currently right here. Um, we're on lecture 19. Um, we're looking at slip critical connections. I'm going to assign a homework today due Friday and a homework Friday due Monday. I'm not going to give you any homework on Monday. Um, I've only got two bolted or sorry, two welded connection assignments. Welds really are like the easiest thing we do in this class. They are very, very easy. Um, and then we have our, right now I have our second celebration scheduled for Wednesday, March 6th. Um, so there'll be a homework due on Monday, March 4th. Um, it'll be like the, the last homework before the exam where I'll turn the solution on right when it's due. Um, and then uh, again, in previous semesters, we would have spring break right here, but that's not the case here. Uh, instead, what we've got is another week. So I'm going to do columns, but what I'm going to do is on Friday, I'm going to cancel class. Okay. Now, the way I'm going to handle Friday is that, that Friday, March 15th, is I'm going to assign a homework and I'm going to have it due on that Friday. Okay. The reason why is so that you all can have a spring break and not have to worry about this class. No homework over break. I, 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 I don't want that to happen. I want you to forget about this class for a week. Unless you want me to give you an assignment over break. I didn't hear anything. Now, I wanted to make sure because I didn't hear anything. shaking our heads back here. We were having I, neck injuries. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cause whiplash among the, uh, uh, the student population. But, yeah, so we'll have, so, so basically what we'll do is we'll have a few lectures on columns. We're going to have break. When we come back, there's going to be one more lecture on columns, and that's mainly just to get everybody back into the swing of things. And then when we come back from break, we're in bean land for the rest of the semester. So um, does that sound good? Everybody okay with that? So like I said, so we have our tentative uh, exam, or right now our exam is scheduled for Wednesday, March 6th. I have absolutely no reason to suspect that we will move that. I don't think we're, I mean, barring weather and all that. So. Sound good? Okay, how did the homework go on connection design? Did that go well? I'm hoping it was simple. Did, did you have to iterate? You had to iterate once, right? Was it once? I think it was once, it was either once or twice. I think it is, what's the spacing gonna be, two and a half inches? Yeah. Two and a half, okay. All right, um, today what I wanna do is I wanna, talk about slip critical connections. Now, if you recall, I said that there were two classes of bolted connections. There were bearing type connections and slip critical connections. Now, a bearing type connection is when you have the bolt hole and you have the bolt and it's actually physically coming into contact with one another. And so failure is either going to be because the bolt sheared or because the plate failed in bearing. Okay. Now, slip critical connection throws an additional load resistant mechanism through friction. Okay. So if bolt bearing connections have two limit states they have to uh, satisfy, slip critical connections have three, okay? So they have to satisfy bolt shear and bolt bearing, but also this bolt slip limit state. So just because we're dealing with a slip critical connection doesn't mean we don't have to deal with all of this. I am going through this at pretty high level because at this point, I'm, I'm hoping that this is pretty old hat by this point. We're all pretty good with this. So this, this should be pretty familiar. So we got our bolt shear capacity, which we can look up and bolt bearing capacity, which we can calculate. Remember, we sort of start at the bottom and work our way up. Okay, 
Um, and then we also have our layout requirements. That's not going to change uh, for slope critical connections. In fact, um, I actually want to look at this. So this is our design process for bolted connections. And so what we've been doing is we've been saying, okay, let's bless you. Uh, let's determine the factored load. Let's determine the shear capacity of a single bolt. And let's divide to get the number of bolts. Lay out the pattern. Bless you. Lay out the pattern according to S min or S preferred and, and LE min. And then check bolt bearing capacity and iterate if necessary. The point I'm making with this slide is that everything, the, the, the design process is exactly the same for slip critical connections. The only thing that changes is this. Instead of looking at the shear capacity of a bolt, you look at both the shear and the slip capacity, and you take the minimum of the two, okay? So what that means is we need to look at what is the slip capacity, okay? So let's talk about slip critical bolts. Um, so basically what uh, a slip critical bolt is, is one that resists its load through friction, okay? So I have here, I've shown you this image before. This is an image of a bolt assembly. Uh, in the field sort of exploded so you can kind of see what's going on. Now the blue forces are what we are applying to the connection, okay? So the first thing that we're applying is the actual load, right? If you have a plate, a plate, you lap them together, you're probably yanking on those plates in some fashion. You're applying load uh, to the connection. But the other thing that you are doing is you're smushing those plates together, right? When you have a bolt, so you have a plate, plate, and a bolt through them, as you tighten the bolt, you are sucking those plates together, okay? So this is, uh, we'll call this force the pretension, okay? This, that's, if you hear me use the term pretension, that's what that means, okay? Um, the difference between a bearing type connection and a slip critical connection, at least physically, is in regards to its installation, okay? So bearing type connections are installed only in a snug, tight fashion. And, and a, a common question is, what, what does it mean by snug, tight? Like, how do we scientifically define snug, tight? Um, and all the stuff about scientific, you'll, you'll see what I mean here in a second. Okay, so snug, tight is typically defined in the specification as either a few hits of an impact wrench or the full effort uh, of an iron worker using an ordinary spud wrench. Okay, so... Snug tight is really just intended to get the plates in direct contact with one another. What you would then do is beyond snug tight is you would continue to tighten the bolt. Okay? And what that would do is beyond just kept keeping the plates in contact with one another, is it would actually generate a significant amount of normal force between the plates, right? And the reason why I use the term normal force is hopefully you all remember, oop, hopefully you all remember that if I have a normal force and I multiply it by a coefficient of static friction, right? That I can develop a frictional force between them, right? And again, it, the, the idea is the, um, the idea is if you're in your apartment and you're trying to move the couch across the room, right? How much force does it take to move the couch? Well, it's the product of the weight of the couch and the coefficient of friction between the couch feet and the floor, right? It would be a lot easier to move the couch across the floor if the bottom of the couch is covered in WD-40, right? Or the bottom of the couch feet. And the reason is because what you're doing is you're taking that coefficient of friction and you're decreasing it, right? That's, that's what it does, okay? So what essentially it's the same idea here, that if I have the normal force generated by pretensioning these bolt, by pretensioning this bolt multiplied by the coefficient of friction between steel and steel, I can count on that uh, uh, friction to resist load. Now, in order for me to count on it, I have to get the bolts snug tight and then I have to uh, tighten them further using one of these prescribed methods. And basically these prescribed methods are to ensure that we get a certain amount of pretension force between the, uh, the plates. And that pretension force is about 70% of the tensile capacity of the bolt. So it's, so it's a pretty hefty uh, amount of force. So what are these prescribed methods? Well, there's a few of them. Uh, some of them are a little bit more classic. Some of them are a little bit more fancy, okay? So one of the more classic methods is called the turn of the nut method, okay? So the way that it works is you, um, 
you get the bolts snug tight, okay? And then what you do is you go out in the field and you mark a series of match lines. So you'll mark, okay, a match line here, match line here, and a match line here. And then what you basically do is go into the spec. So, if, I mean, I actually put the page reference in the spec if you want to look it up. But basically it'll say, okay, dependent upon the bolt grade, bolt diameter, et cetera, what you would do is turn it maybe a half a turn past snug tight or a third of a turn past snug tight or, or what have you. And once you achieve that, um, uh, uh, that turn, you, you've achieved the, uh, the, the specific pretension. Um, if you've ever been on a, uh, a DOH construction site and see them install um, splice plates, um, it's possible that you saw this. I, I don't know if anybody's been in that environment. Uh, but if you ever see like bolted connections and you see these like little white chalk marks or these white paint marks, that's what they're doing. They're basically trying to get it past snug tight to generate that specific amount of, of pretension. So again, by doing this, we're locking a significant amount of tensile force uh, in that bolt. I mean, basically what we're doing is we're taking that bolt and we're really, really stretching it, right? But imagine like I have a, like a rope sticking out of this wall. If I'm applying a lot of tension to the rope, well, the only way to do that is to push on the wall, right? I've got to do that. So basically by stretching the bolt, you are compressing the plate. Uh, that's, that's, that's what's going on. And so basically what we're trying to do is stretch it to a prescribed amount. Okay, does that make sense? All right, one other method uh, in the field is to use a, uh, a calibrated wrench. So um, what you'll see on the, uh, on the construction site is a device that looks like this. This is a, a pretty common uh, 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 method for calibration. This device is called a Skidmore Wilhelm. So basically what this is, is a super duper hyper accurate bathroom scale, just one that's a, a, of a much higher uh, capacity. So the idea is that I've got this wrench that I'm using in the field and I've got this. You'll see if you're ever on a, a steel frame erection site and there, there's, um, they're needing to install slip critical connections. You'll see one of these like mounted to the column. That's what these little twisties are here for. They'll stick them on the flange and just uh, 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 affix it there. But the idea is that you'll stick a bolt through there and you'll use your wrench on that bolt and then the, the, the Skidmore Wilhelm will read the amount of pretension you're generating. And so the idea is that before you start installing bolts, you go through and use that to make sure that the wrench that you're using is calibrated to generate the specific amount of pretension. Uh, they're pretty simple, um, but one downside is that um, once you calibrate your wrench, you have to like keep using it. And once you stop using it, you have to go back and recalibrate it. It's like if you go on a lunch break or a smoke break or something, you have to go back and recalibrate it. So that's one, down, I guess, downside. But, um, uh, but I just wanted to mention that as, a, uh, as an option that you might see on the site. Um, I, I would say what's starting to get a lot more common these days are twist-off control bolts. Twist-off control bolts um, are really, really handy because you only need to have a wrench on one side, sorry, one side of the, um, uh, uh, of the connection. Uh, like if you actually look at the twist-off control bolt, the top end is rounded. Like you, you're not even really meant to get a wrench around it. So the idea is you use this uh, uh, special wrench that actually grips the the connection in two places. It grips the bolt and the nut and it spins them opposite directions. So by spinning them in opposite directions, it's tightening it for you. So again, you only have to have the wrench on one side. And what happens is the, um, the, the bolt itself has this little like splined end, this little nub here on the, on the end of it. Once the bolt achieves its specific pretension, there's a little shear inside the, uh, the wrench that shears that little spline tip off, okay? So one of the reasons it's really, really nice is because for one, it's really easy to install. You only need a wrench on one side, so it can be done by one person. Or, you know, I mean, if you're, think about like the Nitro of St. Albans Bridge. I keep going to that bridge just because it's so massive. If you're trying to install a splice connection, you need somebody on the other end of the girder holding the wrench. Like, you, I mean, the girder's 11 foot deep. You can't like, I'll hold with this hand and this hand, like it's, it's eight foot deep, you're, you're not, your arms aren't that long. So you need somebody on the other end. But with this, you don't. Like you can have one person on one end uh, uh, completely installing the, uh, 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 the connection. Um, and it's also a dream from an inspector's perspective because all the inspector has to do is look and if all the bolts have this little splined end cut off, then they know that the pretension has been met. So it's a lot easier to just, um, uh, it's a lot easier to just look and make sure that, that the, uh, 
installation conforms to specification. The one downside, I guess, is that they can be expensive. I mean, it's convenient, it's fast, and it's easy to inspect. You know what I mean? That, that's going to cost money, right? So um, it's one of those, like, uh, what's the pyramid of project management? You have quality, speed, and cost. Or, 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 or uh, economy, you can only get two of them, you know what I mean? Like if you want a quality product that's fast, it's gonna be expensive, you know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah. Have y'all heard that before? The, the pyramid? Okay, I was just curious, all right. Um, another method, uh, which is maybe a little bit more uh, economical, but, it's, um, uh, but it also has a uh, similar function, is what's called a DTI. A DTI, or a direct tension indicator, is essentially a washer, okay? So what happens is, uh, so here's the washer, and the washer has these little sort of nubs sticking out uh, up right here. Uh, and the idea is that here's, so here's the, the threaded installation, and then as you apply the pretension, what you're doing is you're mashing those nubs down, right? And if you mash those nubs down a particular amount, and they have these little feeler gauges that you can use to, see whether or not you've met the pretension, then, then, you, then your pretension uh, has been achieved. What, there's another brand of DTIs which are kind of interesting. So it's uh, a DTI indicator, but instead of just this solid nub, this solid nub is hollow, and it's got this like orange goop inside it. And so the idea is you start tightening the connection, and then once you hit that pretension, the goop shoots out. It's like this petroleum-based orange goop. And then once you see the goop shoot out, oh, okay, I've met my pretension. So it's another, um, means of, of achieving pretension that's cheap uh, and fast. So again, these washers are gonna be obviously more expensive than regular washers. The, the one downside is, yeah, they're cheap and they're easy to inspect, but you still need a wrench on either side. So again, just, just trade-offs that you gotta be aware of. Okay, sound good? All right, so how do you compute the capacity of a slip critical bolt? Well, the capacity of a slip critical bolt is very much akin to this expression, to the expression for uh, friction uh, between two surfaces, the normal force multiplied by the coefficient of static friction. It's the same thing here, okay? So if you look at the expression, there's a lot of stuff here, okay? But basically what I propose to you is that it's this expression with a few correction factors, okay? So what do we have? We've got mu, we've got this term du, this term hf, this term tb, and this term ns, okay? Um, I propose that when it's all said and done, you'll understand what each of these terms mean, and it's a lot easier than you would think. But to relate it to um, physics, to, to basic statics and basic physics, mu is our coefficient of friction, and T sub B, that's the normal force. That's the bolt pretension. That's the amount of force that you get inside the bolt from using one of these um, uh, uh, pre-qualified installation methods. Okay, one thing that is sort of, um, maybe takes a little getting used to, is that. The fee value is one, okay? Um, the main reason why is because, keep in mind that if you fail slip, you do still have bolt shear and bolt bearing, um, and so um, you've got other limit states that, that, that can account for that. So, um, and the other thing I'll mention is you're going to see here in a second how the expression that we use does even have some conservatism sort of built into it already. That, that'll make sense here in a second. Okay. Um, with me so far? Okay. Okay. So there's a lot going on here. Um, so first off, we have our fee value, which is one. We have our resistance, which is kip, our uh, RN and kips. Okay, so what are all these different terms? And don't worry, I'm gonna explain these in, in some more detail. But mu, that's our slip coefficient. That's the coefficient of friction between the refrigerator and the floor or the couch and the floor, specifically between the two plates of steel that you are loading. So if you have plate, plate, load like this, mu is that coefficient of friction between the uh, two plates. Now D sub u is just 1.13. It's just a constant value of 1.13. And so I know some of you are thinking like, well, if it's 1.13, why don't you just put 1.13 in the equation? Why is this D sub U term there? Um, I'll get to that here in a second. Um, I do want to mention some of the other terms. So H sub F is what we're going to call a factor for filler plates. And um, 
In most practical applications, H sub F is going to be 1, and it's going to be 1 in all the cases that we deal with. But I will explain what H sub F is here in a second. Um, but suffice to say for you all, it's going to be 1. T sub B is our fastener tension, and N sub S is the number of slip planes. And just so everybody's aware, the number of slip planes is basically the same thing as the number of shear planes. Okay. Now, what's the deal with this D sub U? And this is uh, where I had mentioned that some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, expression that we're used, I mean, there's some conservatism built into it. Okay? So D sub U is a multiplier. And so what it does is it reflects the ratio between how much pretension that you specify versus how much you actually get in the field. Okay? So what that means is, um, just to keep the numbers simple, if I have a bolt and I use one of these prescribed methods, these prescribed methods might be guaranteeing that you get 100 kips in pretension. But the truth is, you don't get 100 kips in pretension, you get 113 kips in pretension. You actually get a lot more pretension in the field than you get from minimum specificity. Like a lot of these um, uh, bolt installation procedures are conservative in that regard. Now, what the test data shows is that if you go to bolts in the field and you measure their pretension and you compare that against what you're specifying in the spec, the ratio is about 13%. That you're getting about 13% more pretension in the field than you're getting from these um, uh, uh, pre-qualified methods. So we use a DU of 1.13 to reflect that. So what is DU? It's not a factor of safety or anything. It's reflecting the reality between what uh, pretension you're specifying and what pretension you're actually getting. Now, um, the reason why you don't just put 1.13 and you put DU is because DU can be changed. Okay? You could, the use of other values for DU is permitted if approved by the EOR. Anybody know what EOR stands for? Anybody have an idea? How about the engineer of person who's designing the connection, if, if they, uh, let's say they're working with a particular contractor or fabricator and they know they're going to get 20%, they can change that if they want, provided that the engineer approves it. I don't know of many engineers that do that, but I don't know, maybe there are. Um, uh, I would say that for most um, situations, 1.13 is just fine. Okay, um, the slip coefficients, um, there's really two options. And this is something that has changed from spec to spec. Um, there used to be, uh, uh, well, right now there's a class A and class B uh, in, in the steel manual. In the bridge spec, uh, there were three uh, uh, slip coefficients. And it just depends on the types of steel that we're using. And it also depends on the surface conditions. So, for example, if we have um, blast clean steel, it might have a different slip coefficient than if it's just unpainted steel right out of the, the, the mill or clean mill steel. Um, so for class A surfaces or um, if I use the term class A faying surfaces, F-A-Y-I-N-G, uh, a faying surface is just where the two uh, uh, plates come into contact. Um, the default value I would say is to assume a class A faying surface and so class A faying surfaces have a mu value of 0.3. Um, if you need some extra friction uh, or, you know, it, it's possible that let's say you're in a seismic zone and you're designing a building and you really don't have a lot of room for a connection, but you got a lot of force there because you're in earthquake land. So you might consider blast cleaning the connection plate so you can get a higher coefficient of friction so you can account for that during uh, design. But unless otherwise stated, assume class A. Okay. All right. So the actual bolt pretension itself comes from this table and the spec. And I actually think everybody ought to turn to this table because I'm going to use this here in a second. So these are the bolt pretensions that you're getting um, dependent upon grade and bolt diameter. And again, these bolt pretensions are about 70% of the tensile load that the bolt can withstand. So if, instead of taking the bolt and shearing it, if I take the bolt and yank on it, how much load can it withstand before it fails? Um, and that's... That's really where this is coming from. It's about 70% of that. Okay. Um, again, so all you do is you look up your bolt grade, look up your bolt size, and there you go. Okay. Now, the one that I think is probably the most um, complicated to explain is this filler plate factor. Okay. 
So let me kind of explain what's going on with the filler plate. All right, so what I have here is an image. I've been talking about bolted field splices. Uh, this is a bolted field splice that you would find on a beam type element, particularly like a, a highway bridge girder. Okay, now typically what happens is the bolted field splice is a prime opportunity to change the size of the beam, right? So as an example, if you have a beam, let's just say you have a bridge that's simply supported, right? Where's the biggest bending moment? If I have a bridge that's simply supported, where's the biggest bending moment? In the middle. In the middle, right? All right. The shears are the biggest at the ends. Simple, right? Okay. So um, you have a larger flexural moment in the middle than you do on the ends. So if you consider that the flanges are where you carry a lot of your bending, the idea is that instead of using a constant flange thickness across the entire span, you can change the flange thickness. Like you can use, like for example, you've got a really long bridge, use smaller flanges here, bigger flanges in the middle, right? And then the splice is where you can change the thickness, right? So if you look here, you can see, all right, I've got a smaller flange thickness right here and then a bigger one right there. Does that make sense? But that creates a problem from a connection standpoint, because let's say this is a half inch thick, let's say this is a three quarter inch thick, I want a flat surface. How do I get a flat surface? Well, the answer is I throw in a plate that makes up the difference, right? And so that's what a filler plate is. So the filler plate is intended to, it's not really there to resist structural load per se, it's there just to make sure that when I connect the plates that I've got flat surfaces on either end. That's what a filler plate is. Now, what the, um, is saying is that if you have one filler plate or less than one filler plate, either no filler plates or one filler plate, then our filler plate factor is one. If you have two or more, then the filler plate factor is 0.85. Now, some of you think, like, why would you have two filler plates? Well, you might have two filler plates if the plate thickness difference, if the difference between the two is something like 3 sixteenths. So you might have one plate that's an eighth of an inch and one plate that's a sixteenth of an inch to make up the difference. Like, does that make sense? So um, the only time you would have two or more is if the plate thickness difference is so wonky that you can't make up that difference with just a single plate. Make sense? Um, I, I don't know that that happens a lot in the field, but just to throw that out there. So just to go through a quick exercise, let's just make sure that we're all comfortable with this. What is the design slip resistance of a three quarter inch diameter A325 bolt? Um, assuming that we have class A bang surfaces and only one slip plane. So I guess my grammar was off this morning that instead of this term in, it should have just been like a comma. So, okay. So let's see if we can figure out what the slip resistance is gonna be, okay? So, for example, um, you know, here's our expression that we're using, right? So we have uh, Rn is mu du hf tb ns. And then, you know, don't forget we have phi Rn. So why don't we just try and figure out all these terms and let's just sort of add them all up, or multiply them all up, I should say. Okay, so first off, remind me, what's our feed value? One. One, okay. What is D sub U? Okay, uh, mu value, let's do mu, class A fang surface. So if a class A fang surface, what's the mu value? No, 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 0.3 or 0.5, right? 0.3 for class A, 0.5 for class B, so this is 0 0.3. Um, filler plates, there are no filler plates present, so we're gonna take this to be one. It says one slip plane, so NS is one. What's our TB value? What's the bolt pretension for a uh, three quarter inch diameter uh, group 120 bolt? Say it again? 28 kips, okay? That's table J3.1. So with all of this, 
Just multiply it. BRN is what? 9.49 kips per volt. Do I have a second? That should be pretty easy, right? Here, I'm going to take my keyboard off. With me so far? All right. Now, I want everybody to turn to table 7 1. So, table 7 1 is where the bulk shear capacities are. That's all the way in the middle of the manual. That one right here is converted. I'm talking about this table right here. The table with all the shear capacities. Okay? Now, what I want you to do is turn the page. And specifically, look at table 7 3. Okay? So, table 7 3 lists the slip capacities of volts. Table 7 1 is the shear capacity. Table 7 2 is the tensile capacity. We'll look at that next time. Table 7 3 is slip critical. So, it's like having a tab there, you got a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 good tables right there. Okay. So what do we have? What did we say on this problem? We had a class A fang surface. So what do we have here? Table 7-3, group 120 volts. So there should be a different table for group 150 and 144 and what have you. Okay, so group 120 volts. We have a three quarter inch diameter bolt. By the way, there's the group pretension right there, 28 kips. We have a single slip. And by golly gosh, gee, what do we have? 9.49. You see what I mean? So just like last time with bolt shear, remember how we computed it once and then we said we'd never compute it again? Same thing here. We'll just look it up, okay? Sound good? Any questions? So let's go through a slip critical design example because I think at this point, I think you'll find this is really easy, all right? So I have a, a slip critical connection that I'm going to do. Uh, let me pull this up here. All right. A slip critical connection. We have a dead load of 65 kips, a live load of 115 kips. Um, we're going to use group 150 volts. We're going to use three quarter inch diameter. Uh, A572 grade 50, and we're going to use minimum spacing. Let's design a slip critical connection, okay? So let's see what we can come up with, all right? So let's see. Let's start off with step one up here. What is step one going to be? There we go. We'll put that like that. So I can write that. What is that? Two sixty two. Okay, I have a second. All right. So now what we'll do is let's look up the individual bolt capacity. Now, in order for this to work, what we're going to do is we're going to look up the bolt shear. and the bolt slip capacities, okay? So let's start off with bolt shear.
All right. So tell me what I need to know about bolt shear. Um, what facts am I going to need to be able to look up the bolt shear capacity? So group 150. Okay. There we go. Okay, that's sort of what I was getting at. So, all right. What else? Single shear. There we go. That's a good question. Um, I would know because you're not, um, that filler plate is not providing load. Like what I'm getting at is in order for it to be double shear, um, like if you had plate, plate, and then like a filler, right? You'd have to be like yanking or sorry, yanking like this and then yanking like that and then yanking like that. And you're not doing that with a, an internal filler plate. That's a really good question, by the way. Does that make sense? So yeah, so no. Really good question. All right, so um, what are we getting here? What's our VRN? 27.8, I'm getting a different value. Okay, now just so everybody's aware, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say VRNV for shear. Okay, just to indicate that that's the shear capacity per bolt. Now, now let's look at group uh, a bolt slip. So we're still group 150. So I wanna show you some notation real quick. If you ever see me say, design a connection using group 150 SC bolts, I am saying design a slip critical connection, okay? So if you ever see me use that term SC, uh, like there's group threads included, threads excluded, SC is, is slip critical, so. Okay, so we have group uh, 150 SC, DB, and we're also gonna have single slip. Now, um, what fang surface are we going to use? It's either A or B. A. A. Okay. If you had a class B fang surface, what you could do is look up class A and just multiply by five thirds. In fact, that's actually what the uh, commentary says there at the bottom, just multiply it by 1.67. All right, so based on this, what are we getting for VRN? And I'm gonna call this VRN SC. 11.9, do I have a second? Now, if I am in the habit of designing connections, if I'm in the habit of designing them, uh, what, um, what value would you use to select the number of bolts? The smallest, the smallest yes. Yes, okay. Past this point, it's exactly the same as what we were doing before, and I mean exactly the same, okay? So, what do we do from here? We say, all right.
All right. What do we got for this? So, hmm, how many bolts would you use? 24. I'd use 24. Yeah, you can get a nice pattern with that. So, and I'm probably not going to finish the problem. I'm just going to lay it out and then call it. Um, Let's recognize that we have a nine inch plate. So nine inch plate, and we're gonna use minimum spacings, okay? Okay, so um, what's S min? There we go. And we're using three quarter inch. So that's two inches. I can do that one in my head. And what about LE men? Remember, we gotta look that one up. That comes out of Table J 3.4, and that's one inch. Okay. So, all right, let's see. So we have 24 bolts. So I feel like we're going back to like, I don't know, elementary school, because 24 is, what is it? It was like three times eight, four times six, right? So let's see if we can figure out what pattern makes sense. Remind me, how wide is the plate? Nine inches. Okay. So let's just make a point about something. Okay. So if I have a plate, like let's just try this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like let's say that this was our pattern. All right. One, two, three. Are we going to be able to use this pattern? No. Okay. Now here's why. Okay. What is this dimension got to be? Two inches. This dimension's got to be one inch. Two. 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 One. Right? So... In order for this pattern to work, the plate's got to be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 inches wide. It's not. It's 9 inches wide, right? So this pattern isn't going to work. So we'll say, you know, 6 by 4. So we'll call this the 6 by 4 pattern. That's no good, okay? So what about the 4 by 6 pattern? Let's see if that's going to work. Or I'll just I'll put it down here. Let's do the four by six pattern. Okay, so let's see. So this is two, two, two. Can is this pattern gonna work? One of them is gonna be uneven. Well, you could have two and one. Well, what I was gonna say here, that's this is a really good question. So how about this? Could we do this? Well, we could do that, right? 
Or we could just make all of these, you know, you know I mean, we could, no, we couldn't make them all even because then, then the, the, the middle ones would be too short. What, what I'm getting at is um, this edge distance has to be at least one or greater, right? But it could be bigger than one as long as it's, uh, it's not LE max, right? Now, this way, I would say let's make it one inch, two inches, two inches, two inches. I'm saying that right there, that's going to be our trial connection, right? And why am I saying it's a trial connection? Why am I not just saying that's the answer? What capacitor? Both bearing. I got to check the bolt bearing capacity, right? Exactly right. Um, I can't just say that's the answer. Now, one of the things I will tell you is that if you look at bolt, or if you look at bearing type connections versus slip critical connections, all things being even, slip critical connections usually have about twice as many bolts. Now, I'm not just coming up with that number, you know, willy nilly. Look at the numbers that we got up here. This is the shear capacity per bolt. This is the slip capacity per bolt. The slip capacity is about half as much as the comparable shear capacity. So that means we need twice as many slip critical bolts than we do bearing type bolts. The point I'm making is that um, we have provided twice as many bolts as we would normally would in a bearing type connection. So there is a good chance bearing is not going to be a problem, right? It, it, good chance it won't. So while I am saying it's a trial connection, my gut's telling me we're not going to have a problem with bolt bearing. You still need to check it. But on the flip side, if we calculate bolt bearing and we get some number of like 950 kips, that's okay because that's not what governed the connection. It wasn't bolt bearing and it wasn't bolt shear. It was the slip, right? That's what we're doing. We're designing a slip critical connection. We want to rely on that friction. Well, in order to rely on that friction, we need more bolts than we would normally provide. Make sense? Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. So I've got you a slip critical connection homework. If you were fine with the last homework, then this one should be pretty straightforward. And we only got one more bolted connection lecture on Friday, and then we're done with bolts. So that's all I got, everybody. I will see you all on Friday.